Want to talk about the latest developments here? Let's bring in Daniel Davis, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and host of the Daniel Davis Deep Dive. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us. We appreciate it. Hey, you bet. Always glad to be here. All right. Well, I do want to ask you several questions, but first, uh, the annual threat assessment of the U.S. intelligence community states that the U.S. believes, quote, Iranian leaders did not orchestrate nor had foreknowledge of the Hamas attack against Israel. Any of that surprising? Anything that catches you kind of off guard about that? No, not not in the least. And and they've actually been saying this almost from the outset, almost days after this happened, because that's the first question that everybody wants to know. Did Iran direct this? Is Iran the, the initiator of this? Ergo, should they go after Iran? Because that's that would be certainly the next level that a lot of people would want to go on if that was the case. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're accurate in our assessment. And I'm, I'm glad that they didn't just take the first initial thought and, and go with it, but actually did apparently some more investigation. So I think that, that that makes sense, though, and that doesn't surprise me at all, that finding, because, you know, we kind of have this idea that there's like, you know, Tehran has this puppet master of so strings that go to all these different groups, and they just do what they're told, but that's not the case. Iran has a loose relationship with many, stronger with some, weaker with others, and they have their own agenda. And we've seen this throughout our time in the Middle East, trying to deal with a lot of these groups ourselves, like when in Syria, when we were funding one group and then find out that they're actually going against another group that the government of the U.S. is funding, uh, and they're going to go where the money is. And they have their own agendas. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. I want to talk about the comments that were made by President Biden. There's been quite a few of them over the last uh, week or so. We know there was that hot mic moment after the State of the Union address uh, with President Biden essentially saying he wanted to have a come to Jesus talk with Netanyahu. Uh, he's also made some other comments here saying that Netanyahu is hurting Israel more than helping Israel during that situation in Gaza. What do you make of the comments? And does it appear that there's any sort of drifting between the U.S. and Israel as the war continues? Well, first of all, on the subject, I, I, I have been saying from the outset, uh, really since since about uh, uh, November or so, once Israel went into the Gaza Strip physically, that uh, Netanyahu is pursuing a political objective with his military that cannot be met. He's trying to bring peace to the people of Israel by destroying Hamas. But the method he is using is creating tens of thousands of more enemies against him than ever existed on the 7th of October. Because, and it makes sense, we saw this. I saw this on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan personally, to where when we went after the, the Taliban and were, if, if we killed innocent people in the process, or even some of the places where we killed the actual Taliban, all we ended up doing was creating more Taliban. We saw that play out to its tragic conclusion in uh, August of 2021. Israel is doing something on steroids because there are so many tens of thousands killed and wounded innocent people that he is creating more hatred towards Israel than he ever created, that ever existed with Hamas. So he is not gonna kill his way to peace. But the second part of your issue there is, is there a distance between uh, the US and, and Israel Absolutely there is, because our interests are diverging. And if Biden doesn't have this, you know, come to Jesus meeting with Netanyahu, where he actually has some red lines, which he claimed on MSNBC that now he actually doesn't, that's not good for us, because we saw over the weekend after he made those comments that Netanyahu authoritatively crushed any thought that there would be a two-state solution, and he's tired of being, quote, rammed down our throat, i.e. a direct re rebuke to President Biden, so he wants the U.S. to keep giving him all the stuff that they asked for and have stay out of what he's doing on the ground. And that's not in our interest, and we'll see what happens with it. What about the Rafa offensive? That's been discussed now for weeks upon weeks. Is that still imminent based on what you've seen? I, I think that Netanyahu is just uh, chomping at the bit to want to get in there because in his mind, he thinks, and he said this openly, that there are still four uh, Hamas battalions. I'm not sure how they actually count this stuff since it's a an irregular group, but he thinks there's four battalions in the Rafa area and he wants to destroy them to complete the mission in weeks, as he puts it, not months. But uh, again, I, I, I don't. he goes into a place like that where there's already a million people crushed into an area that's supposed to house 250,000, then you can see that the chances for civilian casualties 
it, it spikes even bigger than what it has so far. And I don't think that the international community, not even the Western community and the U.S., is going to stand by and allow tens of thousands more people to be killed while just ostensibly going after uh, four battalions of Hamas in a, casual, a careless way. Now we're in the month of Ramadan, so the emotions are even peaked higher in the Middle East. Uh, and, and it certainly would not be wise for Netanyahu to go in during this time uh, and to allow this period of, uh, of, a, of a ceasefire to take effect. He could reap so much political benefit from that. It just remains to be seen whether he's going to do something wise or if he's going to go ahead and do it anyway. And either is possible. And there are growing questions here about Sinwar, the uh, leader there of Hamas in Gaza. Does anyone really seem to know not only where he is, but if he's actually alive? I, you know, no one does, no one knows for sure. I, you know, maybe the upper echelon in Hamas in the Strip knows, uh, but but nobody does outside. And and you know, he's trying to keep a low profile because he's seen that several of the top leaders have been taken out, and they, he knows for sure he is an, a prime number one target, just like we were going after uh, Bin Laden after 9/11. So he definitely has motivation to keep a low profile. But I tell you, it probably doesn't matter. I mean, I, I think it's eventually they're going to get him no matter what, just like we were, uh, you know, never going to stop until we had bin Laden. But it's not going to really make any difference in the war uh, because the whole issue that caused the rise of Hamas was the conditions on the ground. And as I said a second ago, the conditions are now immeasurably worse for the Palestinians. So with or without Sinwar, the the hatred that is building in the Strip and in the region against Israel is only going to continue to rise, and it won't go away if he is, is killed. It does sound as though Israel has taken out the man who is known as Hamas's quote-unquote number three. How significant overall is that move if that is the case? I know they're still investigating, trying to figure out, but how significant of a move would that be? It's not. It's. I know that everybody loves to to think it is, and everybody always celebrates it when it comes. Uh, and just in the the matter of justice, then then that's something that could satisfy some. But it won't have any operational impact at all. And I, I've personally observed this throughout all my time in, in these these uh, counterinsurgency wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Every time we took out a, a senior ranking member, there was never any shortage of people to immediately replace him. And it'll be the same way here. Hamas as an organization probably won't survive this anyway. I think that's most likely. But something else will rise to take its place, as it always happens. When you have this many people with this much anger, somebody else will fill the gap. So it's just not going to have any effect. Do you see any end in sight to the Israel-Hamas war? It, the only end is going to come if, if Biden, frankly, grows a backbone and stands up for American moral values and our national interest and says, you either stop this kind of just bulldozer operation going into people's uh, lives and, and killing large numbers of them, or we're not going to give you any more weapons. That's the only leverage we have. Without that stopping, uh, it, it doesn't appear that, that Netanyahu is going to be stopped by anything or anybody, and he's going to continue to go into what he thinks is a military outcome. And then, like I said, the, he's not going to be happy with the result of that. Does it seem as though there is, we talked about a disconnect possibly between the U.S. and Israel, but does it almost seem as though there's maybe a disconnect in Israel? Because you have Netanyahu here who is saying one thing, and then you have folks in Israel who are actually protesting against Netanyahu and want a new election. Is there any kind of disconnect within Israel? Oh, there's a huge disconnect within Israel, or maybe not a disconnect, but a division within where people on the one side are, are adamantly opposed to this. You have a, a group of people, especially as related to the hostages that have been taken, that are absolutely livid that Netanyahu doesn't take his foot off the gas so that he can try to get those hostages back and then proceed with whatever military he wants to. He has seemed unwilling to do that, and that's just caused lots of anger among the civilian population because they're like, you don't seem to care about us or our people. You just seem to care about the bulldozer. Uh, then there's also another group that the people who are completely supportive of Netanyahu, like in large numbers as well. So you have maybe like 55 percent on Netanyahu's side, but a pretty sizable group on the other. And they have been protesting a lot in recent weeks uh, and growing because they I think many of them see the same thing I do, that this is not going to end well for Israel and they have to change course. But unfortunately, lots of others are on his side. 
We did see this past weekend over in Tel Aviv as you had uh, those protesters who were demanding an election. They were uh, going back and forth there. There was a clash with security forces and pretty much all the experts I've spoken to have said there's likely going to be more of that as we see these protests continue. Uh, yep. Daniel Davis there, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, host of the Daniel Davis Deep Dive. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and break down the latest. Anything else you want to add before I let you go? No, just, just the bottom line is that, that I, I know that there is reflexive support for Israel for all the reasons that everybody knows has been for decades, and it's and it's properly placed. But if we actually care about the Israeli people and about them having peace, we have to pers pursue a policy that has a path for peace for both Israel or Palestine, or neither one of them are going to have peace. And that is where America's interest primarily lies. Daniel, thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us. Thanks very much.